Greetings, I'm Mike Grontman, USC and IBEX co-investigator. Unfortunately, I couldn't join this meeting in person. This is the beginning of a new semester with major administrative challenges due to coming back out of the pandemic. Therefore, this brief video talk, thank you for understanding. The talk is about the effects of giant planets on interstellar helium flux. Now, measurement of interstellar helium flux coming from the interstellar medium is one of the main tasks uh, on the IBEX mission. So the idea and the concept are very well known. Uh, interstellar medium, the interstellar wind approaches the solar system with the velocity approximately 26 uh, kilometers per second, the temperature 8000 degrees Kelvin. When the interstellar helium atoms are flying into the solar system, they follow uh, trajectories in the gravitational field of the Sun. The interstellar wind comes from the direction approximately plus 5 degrees of ecliptic latitude and uh, 255 degrees in uh, ecliptic uh, longitude. The trajectory of the helium atoms uh, touches the one astronomical unit, the orbit of the Earth, at uh, the angle approximately 126 degrees with respect to the interstellar wind vector and this position is the most advantageous for detection of interstellar helium atoms. So this position is approximately in January and February of each year. These are the seasons for observation of interstellar helium and the figure at the bottom shows uh, the map of the sky in intensities of interstellar helium atoms. Accuracy of reconstructing the interstellar wind vector and such experiments started on the Ulysses a uh, couple decades ago and now on IBEX. So the accuracy of reconstruction of the interstellar wind vector is uh, close to a fraction of one tenth of one degree actually. And uh, with uh, such accuracies, we need to look at the other possible disturbances that may affect penetration of the interstellar helium atoms in the solar system. So the giant planets could provide such disturbances. Now, disturbances by Jupiter and the Earth were mentioned in the literature, but were really never uh, quantified. So the goal of this work is to establish observational seasons where Jupiter and Saturn, two the most massive planets in the solar system, may affect interstellar helium flux properties. So when a body, as a, a helium atom for example, flies by a massive planet, it will deflect in the gravitational field of the planet. And the angle of the deflection, chi, is a function of the mass of the planet, relative velocity of the approaching body to this planet, and the impact parameter, rho. The typical flyby velocities for the interstellar helium atoms with respect to Jupiter and Saturn are 35 kilometers per second and 31 kilometers per second, respectively. So one can calculate this deflection angle as a function of um, the impact parameter and for Jupiter and Saturn they are shown on the right. The impact parameter is in astronomical units and uh, this is the deflection angle in degrees. I will use two deflections at the angle 0.1 degree and 0.4 degrees as a references, sort of as the benchmark to look at the importance of the effects. And uh, to these angles, the corresponding impact parameters are for Jupiter 0.8 astronomical units and 0.2 astronomical units. So, and for Saturn, they are smaller, approximately 0.18 and 0.08 astronomical units. And it's understandable that for Saturn, these uh, impact parameters are smaller because the mass of this Saturn is smaller than that of Jupiter. So if I look at the observation of a helium atom as it approaches this most uh, advantageous point for observation, where the trajectory, the hyperbolic trajectory of the helium atom is tangential to the Earth orbit, the red line shows such a trajectory that goes to infinity, and this figure is 
to scale. This is the Jupiter's orbit around five astronomical units and this is the Saturn's orbit on the left close to 10 astronomical units. Again this figure is to scale. The yellow dots show the time tags 50 days apart so it takes roughly 250 days for a helium atom to reach the observation point at 1 AU from crossing the Jupiter's orbit and about 500 days from crossing the Saturn's orbit. In this work I assumed that the interstellar wind vector is in the ecliptic plane so the ecliptic latitude of incoming atoms is zero. The interstellar helium atoms in the local interstellar medium would have a spread in velocities and directions due to non-zero temperature of interstellar gas. Because of that the atoms when they come to the observation point they will be coming from slightly different directions and slightly different velocities. Because of that they will be crossing for example the Jupiter's orbit at a different places. If this red trajectory is the trajectory of a helium atom, if a Jupiter is somewhere within this red circle, then it will cause the deflection point 4 degrees or higher. And if a Jupiter is somewhere within this blue circle, then the deflection would be 0.1 degree or higher. And for Saturn, these red and blue circles are obviously smaller because of the mass of Saturn is smaller. So as we said, the particles with a slightly different magnitudes of velocities and the directions, because the field of view of a sensor is not a delta function, let's say plus minus three degrees for Ibex, because of that the particles will be coming, the helium atoms will be coming at slightly different directions with a slightly different velocities and they will be crossing the orbit of Jupiter and Saturn at slightly different places and on top of that because the velocities are different there will be different times of flight from the crossing of the orbit to the observation point and to make the situation even more complex observations are not performed in one point here but during a season say one month long plus minus 15 degrees for example because of that whatever we measure during the observational season the particles will be crossing the uh, orbit of Jupiter at a very different places. I found it very convenient rather than to consider where exactly the crossing occurred here to reduce everything to the following. So if I detect a helium atom with a certain velocity coming from a certain direction at a certain point at the orbit of the Earth then I ask myself a question where was the Jupiter during that moment of time, the moment of time of detection. So I'm accounting for the time of flight from the orbit. And for this nominal trajectory of the helium atoms, Jupiter would be just right here. So if I detect a helium atom coming along this trajectory and at the moment of detection my Jupiter was somewhere within this red circle, that means that the atom trajectory was affected by 0.4 degrees or higher and if it's within the blue circle then it was affected by, by 0.1 degree or higher. Let me just illustrate this on another figure. Here I have a family of trajectories. The trajectory with the zero thermal velocity at infinity and coming uh, normal to the radial direction at the, at the nominal observation point is shown that one with the yellow time tags. If I look at the velocities of the helium atoms coming along this trajectory normal to the radius but with the spread of plus minus two kilometers per second corresponding to the spread of the thermal velocities at infinity so this would be the trajectory marked u1, u0 and u2 so you see they're just different crossing the orbit of uh, Jupiter at different places and also time of flight from the moments of crossing to the observation points are different. If I look at the realistic field of view plus minus three degrees of a sensor then this will be trajectory U4, the red one, and U5. So it's again they will be just crossing the orbits at different places and the time of flights are different. And if I add 
observations uh, 15 days prior to the Earth being at this nominal point and plus 30 days one month later, then I will get this magenta curve U7 and the green curve U8. So you see there is a very large region of the and the moments of time when the helium atoms that are crossing the Jupiter's orbit and uh, they when they reach to the point where they are detected. If the Jupiter is somewhere here during the crossing, the trajectories would be affected. And again, what I am doing, I am reducing these moments of time and the positions of crossing to the positions of the Jupiter at the moment of the detection. Again, it's just a convenient, it's a convenient way of doing that. So for a realistic field of view of sensors, and because sensors also do not discriminate with respect to the velocity of the helium atoms that are being detected, a fraction of detected helium atoms during the season could be affected by the gravitational field if a Jupiter is somewhere here. And the similar analysis is for Saturn. What are the results of the consideration of this problem? First of all, on the left, there is a figure showing ecliptic longitude of Jupiter and Saturn as a function of time. The vertical cyan lines show the observational seasons centered on January 30th of each year. So the Jupiter ecliptic longitude is shown in blue, which is uh, just going right here and there, and Saturn is in black. Now let us look at the magnified part of this figure to understand how it works. Based on the analysis that is done of the position of the Jupiter and Saturn, during the moment of observation, I can uh, provide the ranges of ecliptic longitudes where these effects of disturbances by gravitational fields of giant planes could occur. Let's first start with Jupiter. These uh, magenta uh, lines, two parallel lines, tell me that if the, during the moment of observation Jupiter's longitude is somewhere in this range, then the atom trajectories will be affected by 0.4 degrees or larger. The red lines correspond to 0.1 degree or larger, so it's obviously the larger range of ecliptic longitudes, and the green lights, uh, lines uh, correspond to the addition of plus minus 15 or 20 days with respect to this nominal trajectory of helium just corresponding to the entire season. So basically, if Jupiter is somewhere within these green lines, it would affect trajectories of some helium atoms detected during the observational season. Let me mention that for Saturn, I put only one curve, not to crowd too much this figure, only one line, this black line, corresponds to the trajectory, the nominal trajectory of a helium atom crossing the Saturn's orbit. So it's just shown right here. So getting back to Jupiter, the blue line shows the ecliptic longitude, longitude of Jupiter. And when this line is within this, between these two green lines, some of the helium atoms would be affected. During the observational season of 2019, there was a, the effect should occur and during the observational season of 2020 effects should also occur but to a smaller extent. If I look to the fi on the figure on the right, the, on the left, where it covers uh, much longer time intervals, Jupiter would be in the center of this range of affecting helium atoms during the season of 2031. 2031. So it's 2019, 2020, and 2031. For Saturn, this uh, Saturn is the black line. Saturn w should affect some of the helium atoms in the season of 2017. 2017. Another question that I would like to ask is the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn they're inclined with respect to the ecliptic plane. The figure here shows the dependence of ecliptic latitude 
with respect to the ecliptic longitude of the planets and the gray rectangle shows the region in ecliptic longitudes where the helium atoms that are detected during observational seasons are crossing orbits of Jupiter and Saturn. We see that Jupiter and Saturn during these observational seasons they are they are approximately one degree above the ecliptic for Jupiter and about two degrees above the ecliptic plane for Saturn. The interstellar wind comes from the direction approximately plus five degrees above the ecliptic plane so during these three seasons that we identified where the giant planets could affect trajectories of the helium atoms due to the inclination of the orbital planes of Jupiter and Saturn this effect actually would be more pronounced because the geometry of planetary orbits is such that the planets are getting closer to the interstellar wind direction so and finally to conclude the possible effects on the interstellar helium flux measurements by giant planets could be in the season 2017 caused by Saturn in the season 2019 caused by Jupiter season 2020 also by Jupiter but the effects should be smaller than in 2019 and then there could be a large effect in 2031 caused by Jupiter what could be explored further uh, to understand uh, and uh, try to identify this effect when the results of observational seasons are combined to improve statistics and accuracy of the derived properties of the interstellar wind velocity vector one could eliminate amid say season of 2017 and or season 2019 and season 2020 and see whether the elimination of these particular seasons would improve accuracy of determining the direction of the interstellar wind vector finally I would like to acknowledge that this work is supported in part by the IBEX program and thank you for your attention